I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. And welcome back to another Blast Off podcast. This is our conversation show, and I'm Judd Myers. And I'm Scott Tipton. We've talked to these pictures before, and I think a, uh, a few weeks back, but you were really a Jaws kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was Still a, am. I was a, <laughs> me, I was a Star Wars kid. Mm. From 77 through about 1983, Star Wars, if you took a, a schematic of my brain, maybe like 65% was Star Wars. <laughs> and then there was like maybe, you know, 30% was, was comic books and then like 5% math. <laughs> everything else is on instinct but star wars just obsessed me especially that first film when i was just a tiny kid i must i can't count the times i saw it you know the at the action figures obs- mm. i was obsessed with those i was obsessed with the comics from marvel and i think even as a kid the thing that struck me most compared to most other science fiction movies that were i was able to see there's something verisimilitude there's a realness to the way star wars looks it mm. looks lived in the, you know, the ships are beat up and banged up. The hallways are grubby. The clothes <laughs> the clothes don't fit really well and they're shoddy in places. And it's all intentional. It, it looks like a universe that these people have lived in. And it looks like kind of the downward end of that universe. And so Star Wars, as I say, obsessed me. And to this day still does. So imagine when I walk into my own shop and see original production schematics of the cantina hanging on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> where did those like, come? where did these come from what well i just drew them off yeah. the back and decided to put them on the wall <laughs> like a printing press in the back no no <laughs> and so this is basically the story that you told me about how these treasures wound up on our walls yeah well this gentleman named alan roderick jones just so happens to frequent our store and we have a lot of conversations about his extraordinary history in the film industry and one of the things that he's known for is this sort of you know, design, art direction, set dressing for this little Star Wars movie, New Hope. And he is actually one of the only draftsman designers from uh, the original Star Wars production that got to keep his own designs and schematics. So he decided that he would like to do something exclusive with us. So we have, he designed and drafted and dressed the interior of the cantina. And also he did the same thing for the Skywalker garage, the Skyhopper. It was all him. And, you know, we have these prints of his original work that are signed and numbered and they're framed and beautiful and hanging on the wall. And we have a limited number of them that we're, we're selling. But having gotten the opportunity to sit down with him and really talk about the breadth of his work, not just Star Wars, which is obviously a claim to fame, but the amazing number of films that he worked on all over the world and the uniqueness of being a designer that also he would draft the set based on what the director needed and then was able to go and physically build it and dress it. That's crazy. I've never heard of that happening. Yeah. And at a time where people wanted him to, because they needed all the help they could get. And so he would work with the director and say, you know, you know, in the design, I did this. Can we use this piece to build over here? And can we make it go in this direction? Because on the design, it does this. And people would have his designs and they were all over the set. Please go like this. So the stories he has, both successes and failures, because it's important to note that when someone does that much work over a period of decades in the film industry, we all go, oh, and then he did this, and then they did that, and then she went over. Well, sometimes they learn more from their failures than their successes and bring that to their next project. And what's fascinating about Alan is that he's very open about it. He talks openly about the things that didn't work because that's what brings you to a place where you know how to to make the clock tick properly. It's a fascinating interview. He's a fascinating man, and I look forward to everybody hearing it. Alan, thank you for joining us today. No, it's great to be here and see how you frame these. 
Well, this is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later because there's going to be uh, some special art hung in our store for sale. So we're going to get to that. First question I have for you is one of the most important things that we ask at the beginning of every interview, and that is, what's the first comic book that you ever remember reading? I think it was the one that really touched me, and I've always been a collector. It was um, The Silver Surfer. (laughs) Okay. And how old were you when you first read it? I can't really remember. Oh, no, that's not true. Dan Dare. Dan Dare. Okay, so you were in England. And... Dan Dare was the first comic. Yes. And mm-hmm. I actually have a book of the comics. Where did you get it when it first came? Like, where did you... Was in, it at a... I was in, in London with Dan Dare. Was it a pharmacy? Was, a... was it a... What kind no, of place? No, it was, was a there? weekly... It, I think it was weekly. So was there a newsstand? Newsstand. Like, got at the newsstand. Got it in the newsstand. <laughs> okay. And Rupert the Bear. <laughs> Rupert the Bear and Dan Dare they go together actually okay so Dan Dare and then Silver Surfer yes. so there's a theme happening here yeah. there's an outer space theme happening here that started yeah. at a very young age for you <laughs> yeah it did but I can't remember actually really getting into sci-fi or outer space at all at that age it was just the drawings and the characters in Dan Dare so we all liked at school. You were drawn to the art. Yeah, more than, more than anything, really. Which means you wanted to be an artist at a very early age. Well, my father wanted me to go in the civil service, but I sat on the exam table and put my name, and that's all I did. Because <laughs> 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 I, I wanted to go to art school, and then I went to Chelsea School of Art. <laughs> oh, Chelsea School of Art. Yeah. And was it a, what kind of course was it? Was it a two-year It was all courses. Four-year? It was a four-year course, painting... Sculptor, life drawing, lithography, fashion design. Mm. They covered the whole range. For young artists that are watching, you went to school, a four-year course. Then then what? Was it a, a network well, thing? Was it... You no, could... I was, um, was going to be a rock and roller. <laughs> it was the time of young Clapton. There was a club we used to go to called the Flamingo. There was Steve Winwood, who was like 15, Van Morrison, Clapton, Joe Cocker, you name it all in London. We used to go to this club and I was in a band and we were going to go on tour and I got a telegram, tour cancelled. That was on a Saturday and on the Monday I got a um, a telegram, not a letter. Would I be interested to be a junior in the art department? And I had no idea what that meant. And a friend of mine, Danny, who was in a year above me at art school, Danny Danish Flesky, his father was a director and he invited me to come and see a couple of movies on location. I must have met an art director because then I got this letter and so I got on my Vespa scooter and drove down to the studios. And uh, next thing I know, I'm walking into um, this huge stage, the silent stage at Shepherd and Studios, and was introduced to Carl Foreman, who had written Bridge on the River Kwai, Guns of Never Rhone, High Noon. And this was his anti-McCarthy movie called The Victors. And there was this phenomenal set of an Italian street and all the English guys dressed up as American servicemen with the jeeps and trucks. And there was Rosanna Scafino, this magnificent specimen of womanhood, you know, just... So my jaw dropped and I was introduced to the DP and he said, uh, this is Alan, my new um, PA. But Alan, I want you to come here every morning, stand about 10 feet from where the camera is because this is where it all happens, all on stage. He said, come and meet the art department. And there was a Missen hut, a metal Missen hut, because during the war, Shepparton was used to do all the camouflage um, models and all sorts of things. And I walked in and my jaw dropped looking at these drawings of these draftsmen. And they had all just come off of Lawrence of Arabia. So I had, right at the beginning, these amazing mentors in my life, because I went from the Victors to Beckett, with uh, Burton and O'Toole. Then I went to Lord Jim with um, O'Toole. Um, so many. I did a silly movie called uh, Carry On Cowboy, Cartoon, A Line in Winter, Nicholas and Alexander, Young Winston. So I just was traveling all over and uh, it became my life. And this is what, 53 years now in the world of design for film. So instead of going on tour with a rock band, you went on tour. And do you know what? In cinema. I never picked up my guitar again. Never? Never. Isn't that weird? Wow. I picked up the pencil and learned to draft. I took their drawings home, bought a drawing board on this first film, 
took some drawings home, similar to this sort of work, and traced them. And that's how I learned to draft. And by the way, if you want to be a production designer, you want to be an art director, tread the road. Don't call yourself immediately an art director or a production designer. You have to know what a lens sees from a 14 millimeter, which is this is being shot on, to a 60 to 100. When you design a set, you have to know what the camera sees. And you have to talk to a DP because you want to know how he's going to light the set. I've walked onto so many stages and seen these sets and I think, how the hell are they going to light this? And I was drawing up the interior of the Winter Palace for Nicholas and Alexander, which we got the Oscar for, for art direction. And Vincent Calder, who was Alexander Calder's brother, famous director, and he designed all the sets for him. He leant over my shoulder and said, Alan, there is nothing without light. <laughs> And always remember, be a politician. Say the right thing at the right time and not the wrong thing at the wrong time. It didn't really hit me until I was actually the boss of my own self, you know, designing, that I had suddenly hit me what he meant. There's nothing without light because you can design, if, like, for example, we're on a wide angle lens here. If you're doing a set, you're going to shoot it on a 14 millimeter. You need to know that you're covered. So you put columns in the foreground, your walls. So the camera can pass that, but a DP can light behind a column. And then people always used to say to me when I was doing commercials, oh my God, it's one of Alan's sets because I did all these jigs and jogs and soffits. You layered shatter, in perspective. Layered it all. And then you have to learn about perspective. You've got to be able to know how to produce a, a perspective. For example, on young Winston, I drew up the, the roof of the Houses of Parliament. We built the Houses of Parliament on stage, but the roof we didn't build, the ceiling. And it was my job to um, take the plans and uh, draw them back to where the camera would be at 24 feet high and have the hanging miniature in the foreground. And I was having lunch with uh, my dear friend who was the designer and his two daughters. We also had Ava Gardner for lunch, Peter Lawford for lunch, and... Um, Mort Schumann, who was a wonderful writer, wrote a lot of Elvis's numbers. And the phone rang. Don said to me, you drew this up. You better get to the stage. So I get to the stage. I go up the platform. And there is the uh, camera operator. And when you do a model, it has to sit right in the center. And he had put the camera here. And he said, this is the best angle. And the, the, the miniature doesn't work. I said, what are you talking about? This is where the camera is meant to be, right here. By that time, Carl Foreman, who was producing it directed, you know, the Victors, and Richard Harris, Sir, not Richard Harris, Richard uh, Attenborough, Sir Richard Attenborough, came up the platform, and I had already called Don, so Don comes up, and he says to me, Alan, so where are we? I said, Don, right here. He gets hold of the camera, and he goes, boom, okay, let's go, we're missing a great lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my life is full of stuff like that, so lots of fun. What was the first production that you did where it was all on you? Seriously, I think it was John and Bo Derek's Tarzan. I've got two wooden spoons, Tarzan and Bolero. <laughs> Worst films of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I get a call. I went from my buddy to Africa because I'd already done a film with Henry Hathaway in Africa. I lived there for four months. I had 12 Kikuyu carpenters, 40 Maasai native laborers, and one white German farmer who was my construction coordinator. And I lived in the bush, building uh, ferries across the rivers, tree houses, all sorts of things. Anyway, I got a call from my friend Brian, who's passed away, sadly. And um, he said, well, look, I'm going to Brazil. I'd like you to go to Africa for me because I know you've been to Africa. I said, oh, yeah, you're going to Brazil because all of those gorgeous ladies, I know where you're going. Right. So he said, OK, so I come back from Africa. I'm only there five weeks and I get a call from Tommy Shaw, who was John Houston's first AD and second unit director. And he said, is your resume real? And I said, yes, yeah, so it is. He said, well, come and see me. I've heard some good things about you. So I go over and see him and I said, hello. And he said, ah, oh, you're much younger even than I thought you were. So, no, you're older than I thought you were, I think he said to me. And he said, well, go in the room there and see the director and the producer and the actress. They're sitting in their room there. And I said, well, what is it about? He said, well, if they like you, I'll tell you. 
So I go in and Bo Derek says, and Bo Derek's sitting on the floor. And I go, oh, Bo Derek. She says, John, I like his sweater. He's got the job. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I'm doodling a sketch of a village. And then I go and see Tommy. And he says, well, you've got to come with me next week. I said, next week? It's Christmas in two weeks. He said, we've got to go. We've only got three weeks to prep this whole film. And I got a construction coordinator from England to meet me there. And I prepped the film, really. And I went and saw every location that John had picked. And because he was a stills photographer, not one of them worked because you couldn't move the camera. And so I changed Tarzan's treehouse. I changed so many things. And he arrived and he said, I hear you've changed everything. I said, yeah, come and have a look. And he came and had a look and he said, thank you, great. And all because you, you had a good fashion sense. <laughs> Yes, I was wearing it's the right... It's not enough to be talented. No, it's, I was wearing the right sweater. Like right now, i got my Nepalese shirt on, which I wear because they're so easy to wash. You obviously, have, you've traveled the world. Interesting life. Mm -hmm. But as an artist, here you are working, working, working. Were you ever drafting and building and thinking, I wish I was doing a sculpture right now? I wish I was painting with oil? No, not really, because I was always... A, at the weekends or in my free time, I would be sketching or I'd go down to my studio area and paint and sculpt or whatever I was doing. People would used to say to me, Alan, how do you do all this work and still do what you do? And I said, well, it's just uh, following your, uh, the inspiration that's coming through you. You know, we're all inspired if we listen to that silent voice and what it's trying to tell you all the time and so if you want to pick up the pencil pick it up but as a writer and an artist you get periods where you do nothing i'm just reading the life of Pissarro, one of the impressionist painters and i was amazed to see that degas monet renoir manet cezanne all these artists were penniless and they were disliked not the salon in paris refused to show their work and then when they did show their work three years in a row, they were laughed out. No one wanted to buy their work. And there was just a few collectors who started to collect their work and understand that these guys were trying to make a new mark for themselves. You know? And they didn't give up. So I think I never gave up. When I came here after Star Wars and my wife and I bought a farm in 1972, we sort of dropped out for a while. I started in the film industry in 61, I received this experience called knowledge. And if you read all the scriptures, all the masters gave this experience of knowledge. In other words, they affirmed, that they affirmed their own divinity in life and then tried to show people how to just go within. But then afterwards, the religions are all created and all the nonsense happens, right? And uh, I met a young boy who was 13 at the time. And his father, Sri Hans, was a master living in the foothills of the Himalayas. And he knew he was passing and he asked his four sons if they'd like to receive this experience. And knowledge is really the four noble truths. You're shown how to go inside and see that light, listen inside. The world within you that never dries up, that Jesus talked about, is within you here. And then in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's you. That which creates life you are and that which is life you are. There's no separation. Man is, has created this G-O-D, this word. We've created all this. And yet, in actual fact, it's just creation. And if you, you know, you're standing on the edge of a swimming pool, you dive in. Once you're in, you're in. So once you know how to go within, that's it. Anyway, so my wife and I dropped out. We bought a farm. She was with me in Madrid on Nicholas and Alexander. We came back. We bought the farm after receiving this experience. We wanted to understand what it really was because there was no one around really who could help us. And we picked up all the scriptures, the Vedas, which are thousands of years, the Ramayana, the Quran, the Bible, all those scriptures, and realized that we had received that same experience because there were, it was no longer similes or parables. Like Jesus said, if you receive what I have to give, you understand. If you don't, I talk in parables and similes. It's right there in the Bible. What was he giving? That same experience knowledge. And it says it is for some to receive knowledge. So after Star Wars, sold the farm, came here, bought an Airstream trailer, 30-footer, and lived in Malibu in the Airstream. Got thrown out of Ramirez Canyon by Barbara Streisand, who said she didn't <laughs> like the shiny object on the hill. <laughs> and I ran out of money. 
because Thatcher was, wasn't allowing you to um, bring any money out of the country. You could only take 50 pounds. I bought a Maserati, I sold the farm, bought a, a 63 Maserati for 2,500 pounds, a 190 SEL for 2,500 and shipped them over here. I ran out of money. I stood with the, the um, Spanish boys on Point Dune with them in the morning so to get work. I couldn't get in the union. I'd finished or done all these movies and they wouldn't let me work in the studios because I wasn't in the union. Even my dear friend, Ted Howard, who was a production designer, tried to get me in. And Johnny Alcott, who got the Oscar for Barry Lyndon and did 2001, he and I went off to Mexico and did Triumphs of a Man Called Horse because we couldn't get work. And he sued the union and he won. And they put him on the bottom of the roster. How insane, this man who did all that amazing work. And uh, so I stood with the Mexican boys on the corner at Point Dune, six bucks an hour, so I could feed the kids. And then I went to Africa. My friend Brian said, oh, I want you to go to Africa. Could you do it? That's when it all started. So Tarzan was the first film that I did here. Wow. So it was just what it was, was a call, a phone call from yeah. someone who knew your worth and said, come. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's kind of amazing. Actually. Yeah. And then back in. You were yeah. back in the. So when the I see these boys, young boys panhandling, it's like, get yourself. Go down in the fields and pick some strawberries. <laughs> a question that I have is you know, you're someone who take your hand, a pencil, at the drafting table, creating something, you paint, you sculpt, all practical. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about practical and digital. Obviously, digital has taken over yes. in film and television to the point where the days of you spending hours and hours first in an office putting together blueprints, then on a set actually being part of the building of something and making sure that it matches the thing yeah. that you've done and then lighting it and shoot all of that. Now you have two people standing in a green room mm -hmm. with this extraordinary ornate library around them that doesn't actually exist. No, but it's phenomenal. I have to take my hat off to these um, these artists that do this work because it's phenomenal, this graphic work on the computer. I'm in awe of it when I see their, um, see their illustrations on, on the Lord of the Rings stuff that I was doing for Universal Vivendi. The person who got me the job, John Slowski, was one of those people. And he said, I need you, Alan, to show them what these places look like because they, they don't have the architectural um, knowledge that you have. So I did, what, 87 sketches on Lord of the Rings. I'm going to be doing a book of it, actually, which you may be able to sell here, the book. But, um, and then they take those drawings, and then he did one of them and illustrated it beautifully. I was like, wow, look what you did. But they needed you first. They to, needed to... my understanding of the environments first before. And then he would take those and do it. But now you see these games and there's some great people out there doing some phenomenal work. And, and it's, it's how the age changes. Even in our world of films, people do this sort of work now on the computer. But a lot of the carpenters and the plasterers, they find it very hard to read because they don't put all the measurements on. Like on, here, all the measurements <laughs> are on the drawings. And so they find it very hard. And then... Uh, for example, uh, this this uh, plan isn't on the main plan. I just have a, a piece of it, and I haven't drawn the bar, but on the there's a little arrow on the, that area that says detail number whatever it is. Uh -huh. And so this is detail of that bar. And on line in winter, for example, when I was drawing up the the uh, the castle or the interior of the castle, you do the plans and elevations, but then for the plasterers. You have to make the full-size rendering of that column cap. And then the first job I got on Line in Winter was designing all the furniture, you know, where it's a period movie. So I had a lot of time of going to the Victorian Albert Museum and finding all the reference, but then I would have to draw up the chair. If you look at the Line in Winter, I did all that furniture. I drew it all. Um, so, But you know, have to know how to detail that. So these new draftsmen that work in the computer... Their technology is evolving, so they're able to use that technology now. And the new carpenters, the new plasterers, are in tune with that technology. 
Whereas when it originally started, the carpenters were going nuts. They're going, oh, how am I, what am I supposed to do with this? And the idea that on a screen you can do a design for a house and then cut and paste the living room yes. and blow up the living room. Yes. And then you're just working on the living room. Whereas you're drafting a house and then the next page is the living room. Yes. And then the next page yeah, the is details. this part of the living room. Yeah. <laughs> and each well, for one example, we was doing, I was doing the Third Reich, and Hitler walks in the room and stands behind a table, right? Stands behind a chair. We found a photograph of uh, Hitler's amazing building he had designed. And uh, so we took that photograph, we colored it, and it's a two, it was called IntraVision. So you have the image here projecting into the here and projecting into the lens. But on the actual stage was a ramp and the door and a chair. All I had to build was the door and the chair. So the door is practical. He walks in and the DP, wonderful man, put baffles where the windows were and had the light cut across the floor, the ramp. We did tests, color tests. I had to paint maybe four or five times all different tonalities and colors to match what was in the photograph. And uh, when you see it, you think Hitler's walking in the door, he stands behind the chair, and there's this amazing table and the building all around him. Now, that was 25, that must have been 25 years ago. So we had that technology then. Now, talking about technology, we get a lot of comic book artists, you know, very famous comic book artists coming into the store. And a change that's happened in the industry is it used to be you draw a 22 page comic. If you're doing two a month, there's 44 pages of sequential art. If you're lucky and you didn't sell them, you, your contract doesn't mean that the company owns your work. They have 44 pages of their original art on Blue Line Pro yeah. boards. And then they have another stream of income. Yeah. where they can sell their art to people. And now art, comic book art is exploding in value. However, recently there was a, a great, wonderful artist, Rachel Stott, who did a Star Trek book. And I asked her about the cost of one of the pages. Like, hey, what if we got one of the pages, we put it up in the store? And she said, there are no pages. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I don't have any pages anymore. I use my Cintiq. It's on the computer and they want me to get those pages out as fast as possible. The only way that I can get all of these pages out, say three books, you're talking about 66 pages in a month. I have got to do it fast. I've got to color it fast and I got to turn it in. She does it all email. on the computer? All on the computer. Wow. And it turns out that there are quite a few artists who work like who that. no longer sit with a pencil and ink and then turn in their pages that way. It was very interesting because I was frame, I was uh, doing a, having an exhibition and there was a wonderful framers on La Brea. So I went in there and he said, oh, this work, some of these drawings are very similar to my father's. And I said, well, who's your father? I can't remember his name. You have his book here. Hogarth. Exactly. He said, well, if you hang out, my dad's coming in a minute. I think I told you. Didn't yeah, I? yeah. He walks in with a little brown bag, and I said, "Mr. Hogarth, I am so honoured to meet you. I have all your Tarzan books, you know, whole set." And I said, "Do you have any of those drawings?" He said, "Well, I do have two here in my bag." And he <laughs> pulled out these two drawings, and he said, "These are the only ones I own." That's all he had of all these amazing, phenomenal drawings that he did for Tarzan, because in his contract he didn't know them. So when I did my contract, and I would say this to all of you, when you do a contract to draw something for anybody, make sure you own the original drawings. Give them the prints. I did 87 drawings for Lord of the Rings. I did about 60 for Hulk. Oh, and um, more. And uh, in my contract, though, I owned my original drawings. And I think I'm one of the only production designers ever to own his original drawing. And does that include talking about, say, advertising? There's only so many films that can be made, only so many jobs to do. Even in the comic world, we see a lot of comic artists going into the advertising world, going into storyboarding for film, going into the video game industry, because they need people who know how to tell sequential story yeah. and not just... 
here's stick figures in a, in, in a box, much more detail. So you moved into the advertising world as well, where there's plenty of money and it's more prolific. Well, the reason being is every film I went away on, I never saw my kids for like four months. I would see them for two weeks when they'd come and join me. And I finally said to my wife, you know, this isn't going to work. What can I do? So then I, I remember meeting this wonderful man, Lee Lacey, in Le England, in London. And uh, I went to see Lee and I said, Lee, do you need any design? He said, oh my God, Alan, I need you. Next thing I know, I'm doing all his commercials, big, huge commercials. And then there was no production designer or any designer working in that field then in the 80s who had had all that experience that I had and who could sit in a meeting and draw and to say, this, is this what you want? You know, and then go home and draft it. The only thing I couldn't do was really budget. So then I learned to budget. And I, I was doing an average of 35 commercials a year. I had teams of people. I was all on stage with these people. And I would say, look, if you want me, try and get at Raleigh Studios. Uh, I'm on stage three. And they would say, well, oh, okay, Alan, we can get stage four and five. And then someone else would call. I said, well, see if you can get to Raleigh. As long as the shoot days don't overlap, I'm fine. Because it ended up being like working on a movie. I'd do three or four commercials at, at the same time. And I'd have three different set companies building because they, they had to be beautifully built. I remember doing GE kitchens. There were six beautiful kitchens to do. So I had three companies building it, two that, on that stage, two on that stage, and two on that stage. And so that's how I worked. And that, I became the number one designer in the country for quite a while doing commercials. Everyone seemed to want Alan, you know. But I, I wasn't attached to it. I was just doing this thing. That was a job. It was fine. And I'd travel. I got a call on a Friday. Hey, Alan, are you free in, to be in Chicago on Monday? I said, yeah, I am, actually. I'm, I've got some time. What are we doing? He said, oh, we're doing Lee Iacocca's office. Oh, I said, oh, really? Where? Oh, on stage. I said, on stage? So I start doing this plan. And there was a three-way comp. It was faxes then. So the facts went to the Iacocca, the sketch, the facts went to the agency, the facts went to Neil Tardio, the director. Oh, we love it. It's great. I said, well, I, I need a construction coordinator. I haven't got anyone. On the phone, it's a construction coordinator. I sent him that, and I said, I'll send you a drawing in a minute with all the actual sizes and make all the walls 12 foot high, and I'll send you another drawing immediately tomorrow. I think Federal Express had just started. <laughs> I arrive on Monday... There's the truck. All the walls are coming off, all 12 foot high. I called a prop man in New York. I said, make it sort of mission and modern. I don't know what his office looks like. I go over to Lee Coker's office. There's rarely anything I could use. I had to build the conference table, which was huge. And the DP arrived. The, the prop truck arrives from New York on the uh, Tuesday. The set's ready to dress Tuesday night. And Lee Coker walks on on Wednesday morning. Oh, this looks great, but I can't shoot today. Let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I worked. You know, there was no hesitation. These days, production designers, if they can't draw, they bring tear sheets and then they get someone else to do the sketch. If you want to be a production designer, learn to draw. <laughs> that's all I can say. I was teaching at, Uni at Pepperdine University. I said, how many of you know who Henry Moore is? One hand went up out of 50 students. I said, you've got to be kidding me. There's a Henry Moore sitting here outside. How many of you know who Monet is? Three hands went up. I said, what do your parents teach you? What books did they give you? I said, you over there, close your phone, and you over there, put your computer away. Respect these professors who are sitting either side of me and what they've done in order to be here to teach you. And afterwards, the professors came out and said, Alan, that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess if that one person that raised their hand, they went away thinking, okay, I need to learn more. I need to know. I can, I can always raise my hand when yeah, somebody well, asks me Yeah, I was teaching these, this school that was all black children east of L.A. airport. I said, how many of you ever sort of thought of looking outside and figuring out how many different colors of green there are? Not one hand went up. So I said to the headmaster, get your kids in a bus and take them to the parks. Take them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Open them up. Because they live in one square mile over there. They don't go anywhere. They don't go to the ocean. They live in this one square mile. It's interesting. How can they see 
all of the levels of colors if they're only well, what they see is every single day this palette it's only this palette well it's like this the original drawings were black and white pencil mm. but it was only last year uh, i put them in adobe photoshop and when i printed them it was like oh my god these look amazing <laughs> right these are rare now you talked about <clears throat> working with all these directors and companies different companies how does that differ from i mean you've designed homes You've designed mm -hmm. entire estates yeah. for people. Working with someone who says, I want to design a place where me and my family are going to live, which is essentially like a director saying, make a you know castle mm -hmm. for me. The difference between working with a professional, a director, and a family, say, what is that difference? What's the... It's chalk and cheese. It's difficult, more difficult designing interiors, which I refuse to do anymore. For homes, mm. because they can never make up their mind. And uh, I did do this um, sort of Italian villa for a friend of mine. And I said, well, why do you want this villa? Uh, why can't I build you a, a design, you a lovely modern home? Because the, the terrain of this piece of land in Ramirez Canyon, in Malibu, you're going to be an athlete just to go up and down the stairs in this place. But if I design you a modern home, we can do it on two beautiful floors and it'd be simple but they're all attached to what they want they have an idea of what they want and i've been telling friends right now why don't you look at some of these european prefab homes they're amazing and all you've got to do is um, do the concrete base and put the plumbing in and then these homes come and my friend in um, Kauai, he had a beautiful piece of land and he bought two homes in um, thailand and they bought them over and, and they sent the people to put them together and he put these beautiful Taiwanese homes on the land so designing homes for people I, li I like doing the sketches now and then my friends I've got a couple of architectural friends so they can now take my sketches and my rough plans and then do the geology which I did in this house in an Italian villa they do the geology and they do all the working drawings after my working elevations because I do do all the working elevations, but they come in and get them passed by the city. So I don't mind doing it. I still like doing that. Jumping back in time a little bit, because I say the best for last, you're asked to work on this sort of weird space opera thing. <laughs> um, you've got Macquarie, you've got Barry, you've got you. You're asked to come on, and you're not really sure what the hell is going on, but there you are in a, in a room. No, I was, I was on my farm, and the, I got a telegram, because we didn't have a phone. <laughs> uh, from John Barry. Hey, Alan, I need you down here. Because I had worked with him on uh, The Life of William Shakespeare, which never happened. And uh, could you come and see us? I said to my wife, shall I go down? She said, yeah. So I go down. I think it was Elstree Studios. Elstree. And I had a beard. Remember the Beatles when they had their beards? I had my beard down here, uh, my big overcoat, my hat. And uh, I walked in and I saw some of the stuff that had already been um, built and then the drawings of Ralph McCurry. I said, oh, it's some sort of sci-fi movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's called um, Star Wars. So oh, great. Well, you want to do it? I said, yeah. But um, am I going to be an art director? Because I'd already been doing stuff. Yeah, you know, I'd just been in Jamaica doing Papillon. But I came home instead of staying on the whole film. Assistant Art Director on Nicholas. Anyway, that was my biggest mistake, actually, not getting my um, title. But I went down. My wife came. We stayed with my mum, stayed with my dad, all sorts of people. And then um, a dear friend of ours we met here in 74 said she was in London and was married. And we said, who are you married to? She said, well, come down and have lunch. I said, well, I'm coming down. I'm just working on this movie. So we went down, we had the kids in the car, I had a Morris Minor, and you could see the road through the floor. <laughs> I used to sell my vegetables on the street corners up there in Wales, and this lovely, our cabbages were huge, and this lovely lady said, oh, it's too big, could I just have a leaf? <laughs> anyway, we go down, knock on the door, who opens the door but George Harrison from the Beatles. You married George Harrison? <laughs> Then they realized that we were going here, there, and everywhere trying to find a place to live. So they said, why don't you come and live with us? So we ended up living in the middle lodge with George and Olivier Henley. 
while I was doing the whole of the movie. And then I was drafting and working seven days a week. And there was Reg Bream, Peter Childs, all these amazing draftsmen, right? And Norman Reynolds was the art director. Roger Christian was the set decorator. But they were all going off to Africa. Roger was going off. Les Dilly was going off. John Barry was going off. The effects people were going off with the model of R2-D2 and everything to Africa. And, and while they were doing that, I was stuck back in the studios doing the interior of the, um, the garage, drawing it all up completely, the cantina. And I was also dressing them. And uh, the kitchen and the, the Millennium Falcon hangar I dressed and did the exterior of the Millennium Falcon. The rim, Ted Ambrose drew it all up. These drafts were amazing. And uh, I had to go on the back lot and I found all this junk and I numbered it. And then went on my draft drawing of the exterior of the Millennium Falcon, I just put numbers. And I said, put all that junk, clean it and just put it where the numbers are. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then they came back from Africa. And I'll never forget Roger walking through the sets with me saying, you're going to get me an Oscar. And then a week before I was leaving, Robert Watts, who was the uh, production manager, line producer, right? I said, Robert, my name's not on the unit list. I said to John Barry, my name is not on the unit list. Oh, well, I'll do that. I'll do that right now. And it'll be on the unit list for tomorrow. And sure enough, here I am sitting, watching the opening of the movie. All the credits are rolling. Everybody but Alan. So I missed my Oscar and everything. So then when Lucas did the second one, you know, he revised it and did a few things. I sent him a letter and within three days they got back to me. Oh, Alan, we've spoken to everybody. We're going to give you a, a, you're going to get a call. So I got a call, said, Alan, we've been talking about you. We're going to give you um, assistant production designer. I said, brilliant. And you know what the credit was? I could have been a PA. It was assistant to the production. Oh, oh, oh. what two little So what I'm saying is always make sure in your contract, you have your credit before you do anything. Please be advised on that. So I never got my Oscar for being in the art bar on Star Wars. That's crushing. That's crushing. And we have proof. This is like a court case. Uh, proof. Behind. <laughs> I was given a little sketch to do this. I swear, a little sketch. I drew this up, made the model. I went down to the prop room. And in the prop room, see these here? We had two fighter jets, old fighter jets we had torn apart. And they were all in the prop room. So I went down to the prop room the first day I started, started looking around. And I remember when John Barry said to me, oh, Alan, look at this. And he did this little sketch. You can see it. And then I saw these. And they were inside of the jet engines. I said, oh, my God, they look amazing. I could use those for the center of the bar. Is it okay if we anodize them with gold and silver? And John said, yeah. And I said, well, why don't I find these other plastic containers and have those anodized? Oh, they're brilliant. I said, well, I can use all plastic pipe up here. And I had that in his eyes. He said, brilliant, brilliant, good. <laughs> I'm going off to Africa, get it all done. All right, John, fine. And you were also involved with the Skyhopper. You... The Sky... Oh, Luke Skyhopper. So the, uh, a photograph arrived. Yes. Prior to the model arriving. Yes. Because John Dykstra was making all the models of the ships here in uh, Hollywood. And he was the one who came up with motion control and everything. And George Lucas, from what I understood, was George never really gave too much away. So when you saw the film in there, it was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. We thought it was a piece of crap <laughs> watching the dailies. But he never really gave it away. He was very quiet, um, George. It was quite amazing to see him quiet like that. And even I said to him when he came in, he was looking at my drawing of the cantina. And I had read the script and everything else. And I said, ah, I know a Jedi Knight. And that was the young boy who gave me that experience of knowledge, you see. I said, I know a Jedi Knight. And we had a little chat. So I drafted up for the garage, which I drew up and dressed, that they wanted the Skyhopper in the background. So I drew that up. And I, I have that drawing, actually, a copy of that drawing. And But you never really saw it in the film. It's sitting there in the background through. Mm. And what you see is um, Luke playing with the model, I think. Do you, in the film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't He's he? holding the model. He's holding the yeah. model. Well, the actual full size of that ship was through the opening. So oh, I see, I see. Got but the drawing is quite a nice drawing. When I look, I think, oh, I did that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I look at these, I think, did I really draw that up? My God, you know. <laughs> That's wonderful. So speaking of these, what we have here are numbered 
prints of these designs. They're signed and numbered and wonderful coloring and archival framing. And these are going to be hanging in the store uh, in North Hollywood and for sale, um, which you can you can buy them in the store or on the website, unframed on the website and framed or unframed in the store. Something to uh, come and see at the very least, see how extraordinary they are when they're displayed on the wall. These and possibly others, but we're starting with the cantina. Yeah. They're not limited. They're all single and numbered, but they're not 11 of 100. It's just right, 11. right, right. So this is a set of number 11. So each set are numbered. So if you, you want the complete set of number 11, you have to get both. <laughs> just I'm just saying. I'm just <laughs> right. This is wonderful. We're very, very pleased to be doing this. And I really appreciate you coming here and telling us all these great stories about your career. Hopefully it's also helpful for a lot of artists who watch this and young mm-hmm. artists, the Art Institute mm-hmm. down the street. And it'll be helpful for them to hear some of these experiences. There's a book that I've ordered that uh, you're going to have and I'm going to have. It's the work of Ralph McQuarrie, who was always my hero on Star Wars because he was the original illustrator for George Lucas. And he went on to design and not design and what's the word I'm looking for, create all the imagery for the Star Wars, Mm. really. And he only passed away, I think it was two years ago. Anyway, there's a beautiful book. You can go on Amazon and get this book coming out in August. That's great. Well, perhaps we'll have it in the store, too, and you can get it in the store. <laughs> Either way, thank you very much for joining us. I really do no, appreciate it. thank you it. for doing this. It's really it's you know? a, a whole heck of a lot of fun for us. Yeah. And to everyone out there, we'll see you again next time. And, of course, always remember, go out into the world and do well. But more important, go out into the world and do good. And listen to that silent voice that's always there, giving you the inspiration. Trust. The word is trust. The Blast Off Podcast is produced by The Colonel, Jeff Fox, Scott Tipton, and me. Original music is composed and performed by Derek Anthony Gray. You can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon.